the main title of this talk is the main result, which is this, phase-free ZX diagrams are CSS codes. And I'm going to say, I guess by now you, you should know what a ZX diagram is, if you're paying attention yesterday. Uh, but I'll say a bit more about CSS codes. Um, but the subtitle is really where the result came from, uh, which was I've read, read many papers about the surface code and about how, the, how you do fault-tolerant computations in the surface code. Um, and it uses this language of stabilizers, uh, which if you're an expert in these things, you can kind of, you can kind of speak stabilizers as a kind of a native language. Uh, but there was, there was always something that I didn't quite you know, understand there. I could do the calculations, but I didn't really understand it. So this was really started as an exercise for myself to teach myself the surface code uh, by translating it into what is kind of my native language, which is ZX calculus. Um, and I think it is quite a useful way to really understand what's, what's going on there. Um, so ZX diagrams are the language of the ZX calculus. They're the things that the ZX calculus talks about. Uh, and they're made of spiders. Okay, so, so we saw these spiders yesterday. They're just these nodes which appear in sort of generalized circuits or tensor networks. Uh, and the important thing is that they're parameterized by a real angle here, which, which goes here. It's the, it's the relative phase between these two terms. Okay, and, and the, um, what makes phase free phase free is that we're going to assume that those angles are always zero. Okay, so it's kind of like the, the um, yeah, well, well, maybe I should say something. So, so we love ZX diagrams um, because they can represent any linear map. Okay, so they're, they're universal. If I allow the, the angles to be arbitrary, uh, I can represent any linear map, also, also things that are not unitary. Uh, they readily encode universal sets of gates. So for instance, here's, here's basically the Clifford plus phase uh, gate set represented as, as ZX um, as spiders. Uh, and it's complete. So, so there's a presentation with only eight rules, which, which actually um, is complete. So, so if two diagrams describe the same linear map, I can translate one to the other using just, just eight rules. So it's, so it's a very powerful uh, equational system. But there's a catch, which is if I want to work with the fully powered ZX calculus, um, Typically, in, in general, uh, working with that calculus is going to be exponentially hard. So if I have two arbitrary diagrams with arbitrary angles, um, if I want to translate one into the, to the other, I probably have to blow up the diagram to something that's exponentially large and then maybe shrink it back down. Okay, just because if you think about how many different unitary matrices I can represent with these diagrams, there's exponentially many of those. Okay, so... So even though we have this very powerful, complete calculus, uh, that's a good reason to focus on fragments. Okay, and one of the simplest fragments is the phase-free fragment. Okay, so, so we assume that the alpha parameter is going to be zero in phase-free ZX diagrams, which means that this e to the i alpha that was here before becomes one. So, so these red and green spiders just take this very simple form. Okay, and a useful way to think about these now is actually that, that this one is still... You could think of this as a kind of a generalized copier map or, or maybe a Kronecker delta between all of its wires. Uh, and this thing is, is like a parity map, okay? So it sums over all of the even parity uh, computational uh, basis states, okay? Up to some normalization factor, okay? So, so there's, there's actually a, a strong relationship between these things and doing linear algebra over the field of two elements, which is the field where plus is XOR, or taking parities of things. Okay, so the phase-free ZX calculus has, uh, what is this, five rules, um, sort of depending on how you count and, and what you want to do with the sort of normalization factors, which I usually tend to ignore. Um, we have the, the normal spider fusion rules, uh, we have the identity rule, which is any two-legged spider becomes a wire. Uh, and then we have the kind of workhorse, which is strong complementarity. This says if a red dot touches a green dot, well, these two can kind of trade places. And we get, say, if there's m, m things here, I should point with the pointer so people can see at home. So if there's m things here uh, at the input, this becomes m green spiders. And then n here becomes n red spiders. And they're all connected to each other in a totally bipartite graph. Okay, so this is actually a family of rules. Uh, and it's, it's, in some sense, the, the most powerful rule out of this, out of this collection. 
Okay, so one of the nice things about this fragment is there's an evident simplification strategy. Okay, so, so if I have some big phase-free ZX diagram, I can always get, get it down to a very reduced form uh, whose size kind of depends on how many qubits I have. It's polynomial in the number of qubits I have, um, linear even. Uh, so I apply um, the, the spider fusion, the identity rules, as much as possible. Uh, and then I apply this rule, but I don't apply it anywhere because I, I might just blow my diagram up really big if I do. Um, but I apply it wherever a green dot is not on an input and a red dot is not on an output. Okay? Um, and then I just loop through. So I just, I just stupidly do this as long as possible and at some point one of these rules is not going to match anymore so I stop and I'm done. Okay, so each iteration strictly decreases the number of green dots which are not on an input wire plus the number of red dots which are not on an output wire. Okay, so since there can never be less than zero of those, then this thing has to, has to terminate. And it terminates with something that looks like this. Okay, so, so here I have some green dots which are on an input and some red dots which are on an output. Uh, and then some kind of isolated red dots here connected just to the inputs, some isolated green dots over here connected just to the outputs. Okay, so that's a general form that this thing terminates uh, at, um, which the general form is maybe not too enlightening, but if you look at some special cases, uh, so, so one special case is if this linear map was actually a unitary, um, then what you can show is this, this is a unitary if and only if, these, uh, these extra guys here are both, there's both zero of them. Okay, so that, so that sort of goes away. Uh, so now I get this form, which is, which is very nice. I've just got some green dots connected by some wires to some red dots. And actually, I can, I can read off something that's semantically meaningful from this. Uh, so so um, anytime I have a circuit with just C-naughts in it, uh, this does indeed translate into a phase-free ZX diagram, so C0 gates look like this in ZX. And if I normalize it, I get something like that. Okay, so what, is, what does this, this normalized thing tell me? Well, it tells me the parities of computational basis states coming out of here. Okay, so C0 always just take computational basis states and compute a, uh, an F2 linear function of those basis states. Okay, so, so which means it's basically just taking some XORs of the input variables. Okay, and you can see that, that here I can kind of read off what those XORs are from this normal form. Okay, so, so in this first spot, uh, what I'm actually going to output in the first qubit of this, of this circuit is, is X0 uh, plus X2 plus X3. And you'll see what's happened is these are, in fact, exactly the inputs that this red dot is connected to, X0, X2, and X3. Okay, and that's, that's true for all of these outputs. Okay, so, so normalizing it actually tells you what this parity circuit does. Um, states are, are a kind of a similar thing, but it's not linear maps. Um, well, so first of all, if it's a state, then, then it has no inputs. Okay, so a state is something from, from nothing to some wires. Uh, and, and, and since there's no inputs, there's nothing for these red dots, these J red dots to be connected to. So it simplifies to this. Okay, and this actually tells me something about the, about the uh, concrete value of the state as well. So a state of such, uh, in such a form is actually always a sum uh, up to some normalization, which I threw out here, but it's a sum over all the vectors in some linear subspace. Okay, so, so some, some, some F2 linear subspace, some S inside of F2 to the N for N qubits. Okay, so notice this is not an exponentially large space. Its, it's, it's dimension just goes within, not, not with 2 to the n. Um, and there's several ways I can describe a subspace efficiently to you. Um, I can give a set of vectors which spans the space. And in fact, you can read those vectors off of this normal form. So if I have, for instance, V1, then the places where V1 is connected to these red dots is, is exactly where there's ones in this Boolean vector. Okay, so if it was like 1, 1, 0, it would be connected to the first, the second, only to the first and second, and not the third output, for instance. Okay, so these green dots actually give me the vector spanning a linear space. Okay, so here's an example, the GHC state. 
So the GHZ state is a sum over all of the uh, vectors which are spanning, uh, or there, it's a sum over this linear subspace. So, so it's a span of the vector 1, 1, 1, right? Because that includes the origin and it includes 1, 1, 1. Okay, and in fact, you know, if I just write that in this normal form, well, that's three red dots, and here's that basis vector 1, 1, 1. Okay, and that's a, that's a very familiar way to write the GHZ state in CX. Right, so here's another one, the, the plus product state. Well, that's just a sum over all of the bit strings. Um, so, so everything in, in F2 to the 3. Um, and that's the span of this space. Okay, so if I write each of those basis vectors, well, that's a green dot connected to each of these outputs. Okay, so the green dot is the same as the plus state. Uh, so, so, in fact, that's a familiar picture of the plus state. Okay, so, so, th so this kind of works out the way you expect it to. Um, but actually, you know, there's other, there's other choices of spanning vectors for a space. Okay, so for instance, this also spans that whole 3D space. And if I write it this way, I get something else. Here's, here's that, that vector with just a 1 in it, and there's 1, 1, uh, and here's 1, 1, 1. Uh, but in fact, if I use the ZX calculus, I can translate that back to just that picture with the three, with the three dots, right? So these things are equal by the ZX rules. Okay, so effects are very similar, right? So an effect is just something with no outputs, so n equals zero, therefore k equals zero. So I get something with a bunch of green dots connected to a bunch of red dots. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much the same thing. I mean, it's just the adjoint. But what this actually describes is you can see it as a set of linear equations. Okay, so, so in fact, it's a, uh, these w1 to wj, are a set of vectors, but now rather than spanning the space S that we're summing over, they're spanning S perp, okay? So giving a spanning set for the perp of a space is like giving a set of linear equations which describe a linear subspace, okay? So you always have these dual pictures in the phase free ZX calculus. You're always describing a subspace with these things, but you can either give a basis for the state itself or for the space itself or for its perp. Okay, and that's the difference in doing this kind of green-red form versus the red-green form. Okay, so, so everything, all of these wires can be turned around however you like. So I could just also see this as a second way of writing states. I can write them as giving a, giving a spanning uh, set for the perp. Okay, so back to this GHZ example. Um, so, so GHZ. Uh, is is this linear space right? We saw it's the it's the one that spanned by one one one. Um, well, I can describe that space by a set of linear equations. Okay, so so it's here's here's a set of linear equations which describes this space. It's um it's the ones where if I add the first two bits together modulo two I get zero, and if I add the second and third bit together modulo two I get zero. Okay, so so the the only two Vectors which satisfy these linear equations are that one and that one. Okay, so this is like giving a basis for the perp. Okay, so here you see the V1, the V2, and here you see the V2 and the V3 appearing. And I can draw this as a ZX diagram, okay? So, so the difference in what came before is, is, is before we had red dots on the boundary here and we had green dots on the inside, whereas now I've flipped the colors, which is why I'm talking about the perp. Okay? And you can also see by ZX rules that this equals the familiar picture of the GHZ state uh, because these, are, these red dots can really just be replaced by wires and these three green dots will just fuse together. Okay, so these are two equivalent pictures of the same state. Okay, so you can, you can boost this up to a, to a theorem. Uh, a state represented by a phase-free ZX diagram is uniquely fixed uh, by a subspace um, of, of F2 to the n for n qubits. Okay, and, and, the, and the way you can prove this is, is basically by concrete calculation. You can figure out what this state is, uh, and you can see that the subspace is appearing just right there. You see, so, so, so that's, if I had a different subspace, I would give it, get a different state, obviously. Um, and as I said, you can do this in two different ways, right? I can, I can either 
So, so this, concretely, this is the same, right? In both cases, I'm summing over everything in the state S, but I can either give a basis for S, which is the green-red form, or I can give a basis for S perp, which is the red-green form. Okay? So, a corollary of this is, is, uh, is a completeness theorem for the phase for easy X calculus. Okay, so, so this is... This has been proved before using more kind of categorical techniques, but, but here's, a, here's a, very, a very direct proof. Um, if I have two phase free ZX diagrams and they describe the same quantum state, then I can translate one into the other using the five rules of the phase free ZX calculus. Okay, and the way this works is, well, I, I first I reduce both diagrams to a pseudo normal form. Okay, so I, I reduce them both, let's say, to the green red normal form. Okay? And now these, I call this a pseudo-normal form because this is not unique, these two forms. Um, but we know that whatever those vectors are, they span the same space, okay? Because they have to equal the same state, so they span the same space. So all I really need to do to translate one set of basis vectors into another set is show that I can apply Gaussian moves, okay? So basically I can do kind of primitive row or primitive column operations depending on how you look at it. Uh, or, or to put another way, if I have two vectors, I should be able to replace two vectors v and w in the spanning set with an equivalent set like v and v plus w, okay? So, so that should span the same space, and that's like doing a primitive row operation. Okay, and the way I can prove this in zx is I just unfuse using the spider rules, and now I see I've got, I've got the shape of a strong complementarity rule in there, so I apply it. And then I see I've got the shape of another strong complementarity rule here. Okay, so here's the one where I've got a single green dot touching a single red dot. So I apply the rule a second time. Well, I apply it actually backwards. I fuse some stuff together. And you see what I've done is actually this primitive row operation. Okay, so, so strong complementarity is actually um, Gaussian elimination in disguise, you could say. It's really adding these bit vectors together. Um, conversely, you can use this kind of rule to prove strong complementarity. But anyway, once I do that, I've, I've proved completeness. That shouldn't have disappeared again. But anyway, so I've proved completeness. Okay, so, so that's, that's basically what I wanted to say about the phase free ZX calculus. Um, let's just give a, give a quick rundown of stabilizer theory here. Um, so the Pauli group on n qubits it's just this group, right? So it's, it's all the Pauli products and then possibly multiplied times a global phase, which is a power of i. Okay, a stabilizer group is a commutative subgroup of a Pauli group, uh, which doesn't have the minus of the identity matrix in there, okay? So we, we rule that out in stabilizer theory because basically that doesn't have any plus one eigenstates. Uh, and then we define its associated subspace. So now I'm talking about subspaces of, of two to the n dimensional complex space. Okay, so quantum state spaces. Um, and this group uh, defines this subspace just by looking at all the plus one eigenstates of everything in that group. Okay, and then the product of two of these things uh, will also have the same plus one eigenstates. So, so it's, it all kind of makes sense. Okay, so I can use a description of generators of some, of some group to describe a much bigger thing, this exponentially large subspace. Okay, and then, and then uh, I don't know if this is at all standard terminology, but what I would call the fundamental theorem of stabilizer theory is if this group S is k-generated, then the associated subspace is 2 to the n minus k dimensional. Okay, so, so each time I add a new generator, I cut the subspace in half. So, I can do this up to n, and this is called a maximal stabilizer group, and this means this stabilizes a 2 to the 0, or one-dimensional subspace, okay? So that uniquely fixes a state uh, up to a scalar factor. Okay, so that's stabilizer theory. Um, stabilizer subspaces are also called stabilizer codes, uh, and a particularly simple kind of code is a CSS code. Okay, and the way that you build one of these, it's just a recipe for giving you the stabilizer generators such that I satisfy all this stuff. You know, they all need to commute and they need to not have minus i in the group. So what do I do? I take an F2 linear subspace, so, so that, should, that should foreshadow what's going to happen with the ZX diagrams. 
I take an F2 linear subspace and then I take another space which is orthogonal to it, so put in another way, it's another space that's inside of the perp of S. Uh, and I use one of these spaces to define my X generators and I use this orthogonal space to define my Z generators. Okay, and the fact that these two spaces are orthogonal uh, means that they have even parities on their overlaps. Okay, so it's always the case that an even number of X's meets an even number of Z's. So these operators, by design, will commute with each other. Okay, so that gives me a good stabilizer space. Okay, and a CSS code is maximal um, when it has N generators. So to put that in another way, it's maximal when, when T is not just inside of S perp, it actually is S perp. Okay, so just giving me a single uh, F2 linear subspace defines a maximal CSS code because I use my S to give me my X generators, I use S perp to give me my Z generators. Okay? Um, yeah. Okay, so, so here's an example. Uh, the stabilizer group, the GHZ state, is this one. Right, so, and in this case, uh, my X generators are are 1, 1, 1, okay, so here, here a basis element becomes an X generator, the 1's tell me where to put X's in this generator, and S perp is spanned by these two things, okay, so if I, if I take the dot product of any of these vectors with this vector, I get 0 modulo 2, uh, so these things all commute, and this tells me where to put my Z's, right, so that gives me my other two generators, okay, so that's a, that's a stabilizer group for GHZ, which is a CSS code, and as we saw, I can write a GHC state this way using my, I could call this now my X representation, right? It came from my X generators. Or I could use my Z representation, so the thing that came from my Z generators. Okay, so, so a, a curious thing about these maximal CSS codes is to get a ZX diagram from them, I only need to look at one kind of generators. Okay, so I can either take my Z representation or my X representation, and I can flip between them how, as, as I like. Okay, so the theorem, um, which, which is in some sense the only non-trivial theorem in what is largely a pedagogical exercise here, is that a uh, ZX diagram associated with an F2 linear subspace S, okay, so if I reduce this, the thing, I know I have a spanning set for S, is the unique stabilizer state of the maximal CSS code generated by that same space. Okay, so, so I can, if I want to describe a, a state to you, I can either give you a maximal CSS code or I can give you a phase-free ZX diagram. These things are in one-to-one -one correspondence with a linear subspace and, in fact, with the same linear subspace. Okay, so, so how do we prove this? Um, well, so I didn't write this, this is not a phase-free law, but, but, uh, but we have this copy law in the ZX calculus, which is if I have a pi of one color, I can copy it through a dot of the other color. And a consequence of this is I can copy a pi from, say, this top leg, I can push it through the dot, and it's going to cancel with all these other pi's. So put in another way, ZX calculus shows that the all x uh, Pauli uh, is a stabilizer of the infold GHC state. Okay, so that's, that's very easy proof. And from that, I can compute the X stabilizers by computing the normal form of a, of a phase-free diagram and then firing each one of these spiders. So what do I mean by firing each one of these spiders? I mean, point at a spider, say, say the one corresponding to VI, uh, and use this rule where I put pi on all of its adjacent wires. Okay, and what's going to happen is a pi is going to come out the front here, and it's going to come out exactly where this thing was wired up, okay? So if this was connected to the, if this VI was connected to the first, say, second and fifth wire here, then a pi is going to come out the first, second, and fifth wire there. Okay, so the vector spanning this space, each of those vectors spanning the space is going to give me an independent X stabilizer, which has support exactly where there were ones in that vector, okay? So the spanning set actually gives me the X stabilizers. Okay, so I, so I get an equation like this from the normal form for each of the uh, spiders. Uh, everything works in the color reverse, so I can do the same thing for the Z stabilizers, but now I use this red-green normal form, and I'm working with the perp of the space. 
Okay, so this gives me dimension of s plus dimension of s perp generators, uh, which is n generators for n qubits. So by the fundamental theorem of stabilizer theory, this uniquely fixes my state. Um, so, so it's proven. Um, these, these are really using the same space. Okay, a uh, corollary of this is that if we translate a maximal, that we can translate a maximal CSS code directly into a ZX diagram in two different ways, which I'd already mentioned. So for example, if I have this CSS code and, and say now I've, I've just met this, this CSS code for the first time and I want to know what it looks like, well, I can either just look at the X generators and I can draw it, okay? So each of those X generators gives me a green spider connected to red spiders. Or I can look at the Z generators and it gives me a red spider connected to green spiders. And then I can go, oh, okay, well, I didn't know what that was before, but now I know it's a GHZ state because I recognize that picture. Okay, so, so, so almost no calculation to do to get a ZX diagram from a, from a CSS code. Cool. So, so that's, that's the relationship between the two. Um, here's everything you need to know about quantum error correction for this talk. Uh, obviously, there's a, lot, there's a lot to know about quantum error correction. Uh, but, the, but the main idea, um, and, and here's kind of how it exists in my head as well, um, is it's done by encoding some logical qubits into a bigger space of physical qubits. Okay, and, and the way you can picture that is I've got some map, and this could be actually an imaginary map, okay, it doesn't need to be something that I do with a quantum circuit, uh, which is embedding k qubits, those are my logical qubits, into a big space of n qubits, okay? And, and I'm always going to use this encoder map to relate my logical space to my physical space. And this thing defines a stabilizer code when this subspace uh, is, so the image of this encoder map uh, is given by a stabilizer group, okay? So, so in fact, I could do error correction with other kinds of spaces if I wanted to, but, but stabilizer spaces are easy to work with, which is why they're used a lot in error correction. Okay, and, and the point is, of course, that we can detect errors without destroying the state by measuring the stabilizers of S. Okay, they're stabilizers, so they should leave my states fixed. Um, for CSS codes, there's two kinds of stabilizer measurements that are relevant. Uh, it's measuring Pauli X type operators. So now it's multi-qubit measurements, but they're all X, right? Or Pauli Z operators, which is the same, but with Zs. Okay, and I can picture these kinds of measurements. Okay, so here's, here's the measurement, and I've actually drawn the two projections associated with this projective measurement. Okay, so one of them is one, of them is, uh, one half identity plus the X string, and one, one is one half identity minus the X string. Okay, what that looks like in ZX calculus is the plus one projection is this, it's a green dot connected to a bunch of red dots. The minus one projection is this, it's a green pi connected to a bunch of red dots. So you can just compute this concretely and you see this is what the projectors look like. So I can think of this measurement as, you know, I can wrap those two cases into one. It's I have a k pi dot connected to, to all these red dots. If I get outcome zero, this k is zero. If I get outcome one, this one is, this, this k is one. Okay. And similarly for z measurements, actually the colors here should have flipped. These should be green dots and that should be a red dot. Okay, so, so let's look now at not the GHC state, but the GHC code. Okay, so this is a, this is a pretty crappy error correcting code, but it's very simple so you can sort of understand how, how things go. Uh, it only corrects one kind of error, which is why it's not, not great. Um, so the way that I get a non-trivial subspace here is I just, I just cross out one of the stabilizers of the GHC state. So now I have two stabilizers on three qubits, which means that I stabilize a two-dimensional subspace, not a one-dimensional subspace, a two-to-the-one-dimensional subspace. Okay, and that space, so the space stabilized by those generators is the span of these two vectors, okay, the all-zero vector and the all-one vector. Okay, and if you, if you sort of, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the recipe for getting this, but if you work it out concretely now, you can see that, that that's the image of this little picture, okay? So here's, here's a, here's a single qubit coming in, three qubits coming out, 
And what does this map do? It takes a computational basis state and makes three copies of it. So clearly the image of that is, is, this, is this space. Okay, so I can think of this green dot sort of with one wire in, three wires out as my encoder map. So an encoded state looks like this. I just plug any logical state into my encoder and now I get something in three qubits. Okay, so, so here I take, you know, here sometimes these things are called code words. I take an arbitrary state, which is a linear combination of my basis states, and I get a linear combination of my code words. Okay, so something that's, that lives encoded in this bigger space. Okay, and now look what happens if I measure one of my stabilizers. Okay, so ZZ was one of my stabilizers. This is what a ZZ projector looks like. Okay, for, for K equals 0 or 1, depending on whether I'm projecting onto the outcome 1 or the outcome minus 1. Okay, and using the ZX rules, I can see that, that uh, the green dots sort of come together and fuse. A pair of parallel edges falls off, and what I'm left with is a K pi by itself uh, and the state I started with. Okay, if I have a dot that's by itself, if it has a zero on it, well, that just contributes um, a scalar factor, which I throw away. If it has a pi on it, that, that makes the whole thing go to zero. Okay, so this is actually, applying this projection gives me a delta zero K times the state I started with. Okay, so the probability of getting outcome K uh, is, is a delta function. Okay, I will... If I have an encoded state, no error has happened to it, and I apply one of the stabilizers, I'll get outcome zero, or, or let's, let's say the plus one outcome with probability one, I'll get the other outcome with probability zero. But if an error happens, um, then I can go through almost the same calculation, but you see that when I took this first step of pushing the, the green dots through, there's, a, there's an error here, there's a pi there. So when I push it through, this k becomes a k plus one. Okay, so, so in fact, now if k is 0, the whole thing goes to 0, and if k is 1, the, the, the whole thing stays put. So the probability is delta 1k. So if a single x error has happened on any of those encoded qubits, uh, this zz measurement, well, if a single x error happened on one of the first two encoded qubits, then the zz measurement will give me outcome minus 1 with probability 1. Okay. Okay, so, so that's how error detection works, and, and, and error correction is basically just using these detections to uniquely figure out which error happened and, and, and correcting it with a Pauli correction. Okay, so now fault-tolerant computation, well, well, let's say a part of fault-tolerant computation uh, is doing some sort of computation not on my logical space and then encoding it, but actually encoding right at the beginning and doing all of the computation that I want to do on this physical space. Okay, so it doesn't make sense to decode and then do some computation and then re-encode again because errors could happen during that time. I really want to work always on my physical qubits. So, so the picture that, that exists in my head for, for doing fault-tolerant computation is I have this kind of, say, say what I really want to do is this little f here. Right? So I want to do this little f on my logical space. Well, then I should find a big F that I can do on my physical space such that if I push the encoder through the big F, it was as if I did this little f on my logical space. Okay, so the encoder relates things happening in physical space to things happening in logical space via this equation. Okay, so, so something that you notice is when I start talking about doing computations in this space, it really depends on the encoder. And the encoder is actually more information than just the subspace that I'm working with. So, so this, this stab S, this space, uh, actually just fixes the image of my encoder and not the encoder itself, okay? which, which is actually not a big deal. It's just kind of a conventional thing. Uh, because, for example, if I apply any unitary, uh, on this side of my encoder, well, I get the same image here, right? So, so, so really, the encoder is this space, but it also describes, you know, my convention of how I want to fix a basis for my logical space, something like that. Okay, so I have a bit more data that I need to pin down there. And the way this is normally done in stabilizer theory is I give you a stabilizer code, 
And I give you some extra data, which is these logical operators. Okay, so, so logical operators are some extra pally operators that, that kind of tell you where your logical qubits are. Okay, and, and, and actually this is where this whole thing started for me, was trying to figure out what was going on with these logical operators, why they were such an important thing. So what they, what they are, uh, or one way to think about them, is they are actually just the encoded versions of the single qubit paulys for each of my encoded qubits, for each of my logical qubits. If I push it through the encoder, say this is the ith uh, qubit there, if I push it through the encoder, I'll get a logical operator, uh, I'll call it x bar sub i, and similarly I'll get a z bar sub i. Okay, and, and these things are, are really just some extra paulys which commute with everything in my uh, stabilizer subgroup, and they anti-commute with each other. Uh, which you can tell because, you know, they anti-commute on this side, so they should anti-commute on this side. Okay, but, but actually what these things are doing is they're just finishing the definition of my encoder. Okay, so what do I do? If I, if I take my encoder, I can bend all the wires around, right, and I can get a big state, right? So this state, or this map had k inputs and n outputs, so if I bend the wires around, it's actually just a state on n plus k qubits. And you can see that this equation of pushing the Pauli's through, uh, this thing is self-inverse, of course, this is just giving me another stabilizer for this big state. Okay, so I'm getting 2k more stabilizers for this thing. So I already have the stabilizer group, which is, which is here. I need to point with the mouse. It's here. And then I just get 2k more of those. So I get n minus k plus 2k, which is n plus k, stabilizes for this n plus k qubit state. So those logical operators then totally fix the map. Okay, so for example, if we take this GHZ code, um, it had two stabilizers and it has two logical operators, which I get by, by pushing the x through and the z through. Okay, so now I have four stabilizers for this four qubit state, right? I could treat this map as a four qubit state. So that now totally defines this thing. Right? And now I have a recipe for building these encoders in ZX, right? Because I gave you the recipe for taking any CSS code and giving you a uh, state, right? So, so let me just treat this whole thing as a code on 3 plus 1 qubits, okay? So here's my input and then here's my three outputs. Um, and I have two representations. I look at my X stabilizers. Uh, of which there are, there's this one, um, and then I look at my Z stabilizers, and it's this one, okay, so, so I have, oh, something's gone a little bit wrong there, okay, so, so if I take, if I take these two together, this would define that encoder, if I take these three together, that would define this encoder, but anyway, you, you, you see what, what comes out in the end is I, is I always get this sort of, uh, this picture of the, C, the GHC encoder. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, 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 the basics of, of how you translate kind of stabilizer code concepts into ZX. Okay, so let's, let's try to understand the surface code using, using these ideas. Okay, so, so first of all, what's the surface code? Many people will have met this before, um, but maybe not everyone. So the surface code is, 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 a, uh, is a particular family of CSS codes, and it has a recipe for writing out the stabilizers, uh, which is the following. Take a 2D lattice, a rectangular lattice, and you can even have kind of irregular shaped things, but the simplest is a rectangular lattice of D times E qubits. Okay, and then I want to color it in in a checkerboard pattern. And every time I colored something green here, that's going to make a... Uh, Let's see, what, what, what convention have I taken? If I color it green, that's going to make a Z stabilizer. If I color it red, that's going to make an X stabilizer. Okay, so I numbered my qubits, 1 to 9. And this green tile has given me a Z stabilizer on, on its adjacent vertices, so qubits 1, 2, 4, 5. And similarly, the, the other Z stabilizers and the two X stabilizers. Okay? And the surface code should give me a way to encode one qubit 
Uh, and if you're good at counting, you know that we don't have enough stabilizers yet. We have d minus 1 times e minus 1 stabilizers, which is not d times e minus 1 yet. So the way that I get the rest is I add these little blobs around the outside. Okay, So I put these weight 2 stabilizers basically everywhere in every other edge around the outside. Okay, So, so I just pick somewhere to start. Uh, and since there was red here, I'll put a green thing here to keep the checkerboard pattern going. So I'll put a ZZ stabilizer on 2, 3. And then I'll skip this edge, and I'll put an XX stabilizer on 6, 9, and then skip that edge and put a X, uh, ZZ on 7, 8, and so on. Uh, and this will give me enough more stabilizers that I get D times E minus 1 stabilizers, if you can count. Uh, and then the logical operators, I just need to fix... There's, there's one qubit in here, so I need to fix two more operators. They need to anti-commute with each other, and they need to commute with everything else. Okay, so one way to get it to commute with everything else is, is uh, well, for an X operator, it needs to intersect with all of these blobs two times, which means if I cut all the way from one edge to another, then this is going to commute with everything. And for the ZZs, if I, if I sort of cut all the way from, from, a, from a top edge to a bottom edge, here I went from a left to a right, I cut from a top to a bottom, I get a, 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 a Z logical operator. Okay, so I just pick any row in any column. That row is going to be my X stabilizer, and my column is going to be a Z stabilizer. Okay, and now let's use the recipe. Okay, so, so, so remember that I only need to use stabilizers of one kind. Okay, so I have two different representations of my surface code. My X representation gives me red spiders kind of on the outside and green spiders on the inside. And what I'll do is I'll just put red spiders wherever I had a qubit. And then when I have a colored in space, I put a green spider connected to the vertices there. Okay, and that's my... So this thing is my X representation. This thing is my Z representation. The only thing I'm missing is my logical operator. Okay, and the way that I make that is I put an input. Okay, it gives me, a, it gives me an input of the encoder. And I connect in my X representation to any row cutting all the way across, and in my Z representation to any column cutting all the way across. Okay, so, so this now gives me two full pictures of a surface code encoder. Um, and the thing that's nice is that this thing, this, this ZX diagram, really looks quite like the intuitive picture you have. But unlike the intuitive picture, I can actually do calculations with this thing. So I can really work with these diagrams and, and compute what's going to happen. Okay, so, so you notice that I made a choice of which row and column I should take for embedding this logical operator. Uh, but actually it doesn't matter. Because just like I can choose different generators for my stabilizer group, I can choose different spiders in this form. So, so we already saw that we can add two spiders together by adding, sort of adding the legs of one to the legs of the other. So actually, if I wanted to put this uh, logical operator here at a different row, all I do is just add the stabilizers to it. So, so this thing is some Boolean vector u. This is a v and a w. If I add v to it, these legs are going to hop up there because I'm adding v modulo 2. So these two legs go away and those two show up. And if I add W to it, it hops up there. So you see that ZX proves that I can just change the row or change the column, my embedding. OK, so, so I'm going to claim that that, that 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 was enough for me to grok the surface code. And, and maybe if you spend some time digesting, then you'll grok it as well. But, but what do we do now with, the, with, with these new tools? Well, we can see how lattice surgery works. Okay, so lattice surgery is a way of doing multi-qubit fault-tolerant computations in the surface code. Okay, and the basic idea, the way I see lattice surgery, and, and, and the way uh, Dom Horseman, I think, originally kind of saw lattice surgery uh, when, 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 they came, when he came up with the idea, uh, was to implement physical operations which behave like split and merge things. Uh, which they figured out much later were, were, were exactly like these ZX calculus split and merge, like a, a Z copy spider or an X uh, multiply spider or their color reverse. So in particular, if I can do these things, I can do a C naught gate, right? Because I can take my logical qubit and I can split it using green and then I can merge it with another logical qubit using red and, and this implements a C naught gate. 
Okay, so you can't quite do this uh, because this merge thing is, is not an isometry. So I can only do it non-deterministically. And the way that I kind of witness that non-determinism is there might be a pi error happening before I merge. Okay, but this is actually not such a problem because if that pi error happens in the context of a C0 gate, I can sort of commute it through one leg of the C0 and this goes into the future. I can correct that error later or I can just change my frame of reference so that that error kind of goes away. Okay, so, so you can sort of ignore it. Okay, so what does that mean in this kind of conceptual picture of pushing things through an encoder? Uh, well, so now I have an encoder for the surface code, and here I have an encoder for a bigger surface code, a D by 2E. I want to find a physical thing split such that when I push the encoder through it, I actually get a green copy and two surface code encoders, and I need a physical thing merge, which is non-deterministic, hence the little K here, which when I push it through the encoder, it gives me a merge in the logical space. Okay. So, uh, oh, okay, that's funny. Um, so now, suppose I want to do a C naught. Uh, well, if I if I have some encoded qubits here, right? So so here I've got sort of d times e times three encoded physical qubits. If I do this physical split and this physical merge, I can figure out what happened by applying these these rules, and I can push the encoder all the way through. And you see that what I've actually done is I've done a C0 gate on my logical qubits. Okay, so if I can do these split and merge things, then I'm, then I'm happy. I'm, I'm able to do multi-qubit operations. Uh, and in fact, I can sort of, if I have magic states, I can boost this up to a universal model of computation. Okay, and maybe another thing to note is that if I, uh, if I do this in the context of a C0 gate, I can get rid of this error just by incorporating it into some later error correction. Okay, so what's, what's the split? Okay, so this is a picture of a, what's that, a 6 by 3, or maybe I should say 3 by 6 patch of surface code. Okay, and this is the picture of the encoder uh, in the X representation. Okay, so I'm going to do something to this which acts like a split. So, so what should happen is I should be able to do something up here, up here in physical land, and when I push it down to logical land, it's going to look like I've copied, and now I've got two smaller encoders up top. Okay, and the thing I do is actually very simple. I, I find where I want a boundary to be, a vertical boundary to be, and I just measure the stabilizers as if this was the boundary of a smaller surface code patch. Okay, so, so here it's very simple. There should only be one more stabilizer here. There should be a, a green blob there. Well, actually, I think it's a red blob anyway in the picture. So I just measure there. Okay, and my claim is doing this one sort of little measurement in physical land is going to do a logical split into two surface code patches. Okay, so let's see it. Well, first of all, you know, I get this measurement outcome J, but I actually don't care about it. I can, I can use the pi copy rule to push it out and I can just change my reference frame or something or do this error correction later, so I'll just ignore those that j pi. So I get this picture. It doesn't have any non-determinism left in it anymore. And now what happens? Well, I can, I can use my spider laws to sort of move this wire, this wire down here, I can move it up to there, uh, just using some spider fusion stuff. And now I get a pair of parallel wires, which falls off. Okay. And now it looks like I have two separate pieces of patch up here. All I need to do is unfuse this dot down here and I get exactly what I want. Okay, so now I get a split, and I get two encoder patches there. Okay, so, so split's very easy, and the reason it was very easy is I chose the correct representation to do this in. Okay, so this is easy if I choose the X representation. It's a little bit more difficult than the Z representation. Okay, so how does merge work? Okay, so here I have two independent surface code patches, and each of them is encoding a single qubit. Now I want to do something upstairs in physical space, uh, which is going to amount to a red merge, um, possibly with some non-deterministic outcome. Okay, so what am I going to do? Well here, very similarly, I'm going to pretend like this is a big surface code patch, and I'm just going to measure the stabilizers that would have been here. 
Okay, so there should be a stabilizer here, which is the XXXX, and there should be a stabilizer there. Okay, so I'm just going to do measurements there and there. Okay, so again, I've got these measurement outcomes, and I want, I want to sort of push them forward as much as possible. So, so I try this, and you see that a lot of stuff sort of goes on to the outputs, but not everything. So in, so in this case, I get, I get these J pies sort of going on the outputs, which I can ignore, but I'm still left with a K pi here, where K is the, is the parity of all of my measurements along this line. Um, and this has come out my input, okay? So that's sort of in the past. I can't, I can't correct that necessarily, so I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, now what am I going to do? Well, I have this picture, and remember how I said I can move my encoders around just by multiplying by stabilizers or by adding spiders together. So I'm just going to take this upper leg and just walk it down like this until it meets that lower leg or in, until it's on the same line as the, as the other encoder. Okay, and now what do we see? We see two green spiders connected to three red spiders, so we can apply strong complementarity, and we're done. Okay, so now we have a merge and a big surface code patch. Okay, and that's, that's how it works, that's why it works, the two, the two lattice surgery operations. Okay, and that's, and that's, kind, of, that's kind of what I wanted to say. Um, a couple of notes about this. Um, this all used the X representation, and this made it very easy to prove the, uh, the green copy and the red merge. If I flip over to the Z representation, it becomes very easy to prove the color duels of those things. So, so, so I guess that would be the red copy and the green merge. So you can use similar tricks to do entangling measurements. So, so this is if I want to do, for instance, a Pauli ZZ measurement. Uh, on on my logical space, um, and I th I think but 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 this is going to take some elbow grease is is figuring out how it works for many qubits and also for mixed pallies. So you can do things like if I merge a a Z edge into an X edge, then you get a pally Y appearing, and you can do all sorts of kind of crazy tricks with these merges. Uh, so I could do mixed pally measurements. Um, this probably all goes through okay. Uh, magic state injections work this way, so if I have something which is already prepared as a T-magic state, I can just merge it in, uh, and then this will give me a T-gate in my circuit. So I get uh, universal fault-tolerant quantum computing from this. So other CSS codes, like the color code, uh, look pretty much exactly like this. Um, you know, I, I, I write down the CSS code, I get the Z representation, the X representation. Both of these really geometrically look like the thing that you read in the papers. Uh, and lattice surgery should work pretty much the same way. Again, needs some, need some computation. Uh, so, so yeah, there's, um, I think, some low-hanging fruit here of just translating things that exist in current papers into the surface code and, 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 just, and just playing around, uh, or just translating into ZX and just playing around with these diagrams. Uh, maybe we'll come up with some new stuff as well, um, and in any case, I, I think you can grok it a bit better, so, so uh, thanks. Thank you, Alex. Some quick questions, and then maybe we can grab Alex over lunch for further questions. Who has a quick question? <laughs> How much can you grok of non-CSS codes? That's a good. That's a good question. So, so we have, we have a way to translate uh, the 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 generators of, of non-CSS codes into ZX diagrams. Um, but it's not as nice. So, so, you, so you actually get kind of the, these things are all flat. You know, they have depth one. These things that I've drawn. But, but in general, if things if things commute for non-trivial reasons, you might get a stack of things that correspond to each of these generators. Maybe you have to commute them past each other and stuff. Um, I think there might be a nice way to do it, but we haven't figured it out yet. Um, so, I think that's a good that's a good project.
tool. <laughs> yes, <laughs> shut. <laughs> uh, okay, but when you drew the, the picture where you were like encoding things and you had uh, logical operations and then once we did them physical qubits, uh, it looked a lot like the whole goal was to kind of make like a functor onto the physical qubits and then it looked like the encoder was like a natural transformation. Is that how you think about it? No, <laughs> but may, but maybe that's how I, maybe that's how I should. Um, I hadn't really thought about whether these things satisfy any nice naturality type conditions. Uh, but but I mean the the point I think of using this encoder as a as a map is really to start thinking compositionally about about these things. So so now we have all of these physical ingredients. Let's just sort of whack them all into into logical space and then and then just push my encoder through and I see what I see what happened. Uh, which is which is not really how it's done in the papers. I think Every, everything's everything's done more in terms of what's happening with the with the associated operators and so on. Okay, one uh, last question. Um, thank you. I'm wondering, um, for example, color code is also based on the stabilizer formalism. So if there is zig there is, there is some correspondence between the Zex diagram and the color code. Uh, yeah, so you can you can pretty much play the exact same game with color codes here um, because they are CSS codes. Um, you can you can you know you have you have this uh, this this graph and then you and then you color it um, and you can take its X representation or its Z representation. This thing looks like the graph, uh, and you can also do lattice surgery. The long edges and so on. Um, be a nice small small project, I think, to work out the details there of what it looks like. I expect it would go pretty much the same way as it does for the surface code. Okay, so. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, thank Alex again. <laughs>